Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the November 18th, 2021 regular city council meeting to order. And I will invite Councilmember Buxton to please lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Council Mart Member Martinelli is absent tonight. Is there a motion to excuse? Okay, seeing that there is no motion, um, let the record show that Council Mart Member Martinelli has not been excused. All other council members are present. Takes us forward to correspondence. Is there any correspondence? Yes, Mayor, we have received four pieces of correspondence, three asking for the resignation of Councilmember Martinelli, Lovina Erickson, Gwen Koch, Ruth Storkel, and a letter from Joyce Baker Ramirez about marina redevelopment. And the following have provided written public comment. Resignation of Councilmember Martinelli, Melina Anderson, Brandy B, Nadia Curtis, Tad Doviak, Pam Dryden, Ruth Easterling, Steve, Ed Steve Edmiston, Elizabeth Rolfus, Priscilla Vargas, okay. Joel Bailey, upcoming council meeting packet, Elizabeth Byrne, Marina Development, Siley Grace Matsui, Council Behavior and Domestic Violence, Joe Schott, Marina Master Plan, Betsy Sproger, Choosing a Company to Build a Marina Area, Thank you. Before we take comments from the public, I would just like to remind those that any person making personal, impertinent, slanderous remarks or become boisterous, threatening, or personally abusive while addressing the council will be muted and removed from the meeting. Individuals will have three minutes to speak. The first person I show on my list is Amber Blumano. Blumano. Hello, Mayor. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Just one second. Sorry. There you go. Politicizing and commenting on my personal and private family matter. While I understand- I'm so sorry, I'm having issues. <laughs> there we go. Mayor, council members and deputy mayor, I'm disgusted and disappointed that the council and the mayor are both publicly and privately politicizing and commenting on my personal and private family matter. While I understand there are elements of public responsibility, the way the city has handled this is shameful and disrespectful. The city has spread lies, publicly shamed and embarrassed me and my family. Even as I speak, you are taking a court case with public record requirements and making it government record while adding more lies and deceitful information. For instance, I'm not choked, hit or threatened. It is shocking that the city we take the word of a woman who's never lived in Washington, isn't even sure what city this is, and has her own selfish motives over me, your neighbor, community member, and sometimes friend. The city has made me feel unsafe in my own home. It's not something that's ever happened to me in my adult life. With the constant shaming, sending of police, spreading of lies and misinformation, the city has taken my power, my choice, and even tried to take my voice. I will not stand for it. I will not let lies be spread. I'm not a victim. I was never in danger in my own home until now due to the city's bullying, harassment, and shaming. 
This body has made my family the topic of political intrigue and amusement amongst yourselves and your friends, all because of your petty elementary grudges. You have demonstrated you have no regard or care for me or my family. So this is all about taking more political power for yourselves, no matter who you hurt in the process. This is 100% unacceptable and wrong, and I wonder what higher level officials and local agencies would think of your behavior and mistreatment. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Ms. Banks, you are leaving office in a few weeks, and some of your last acts will be to aid in trying to tear a loving family apart, spreading lies and discord throughout our town. I hope people know all of you have no regard for your citizens or colleagues and only care for yourselves and your own political agendas. Going so far as to harass supposed victims. To any victims listening, my heart hurts for you. Please know that whatever you're going through, there is help out there. People will help and come to your aid. Just because I do not need it does not mean that you should not seek it. Even though the city has proven they will not be there for victims in their time of need. If it goes against the city's personal goals, others will be. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak as per my rights. And I will ask one final time, please leave me and my family alone. Leave us out of the headlines and the government conversation. You've done enough, so stop. Okay, the next person to speak, uh, do I have Rick Vargas? No? Okay. Okay, so the next one would be Christine Puzas. Christine Puzas. Christine, are you out there? Yep. It is working. I can hear you. You can hear me. Okay. Um, hi. Hopefully, I don't become deer in the headlights and I don't have it recorded. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I know that you guys are working really hard on the marina and the plan for the marina. Um, to let you know, I've lived here my whole life. I grew up in Normandy Park and remember when we had the Waterland festivals and everything. And what I see and read in its entirety is a development plan that was developed obviously by the developer more so than by the uh, citizens and their input. There was very few citizens that were brought in. Um, and there's, there's talk of the property that would be north of the staircase being sold to pay. I don't know if that's true that stock. If that is the case, we have other options. Uh, one of the biggest assets that we have besides this wonderful gem of a marina is your people. Your people is the biggest asset that hasn't been tapped. We have some of the sharpest minds and the hardest workers here. We have, we have Boeing engineers. We have Microsoft people. We have all of that. And these people are willing to bond on an idea that actually benefits all of it. You also said that it's the gateway. Yes, it's the gateway to Des Moines. The plan as I saw is actually stopping everyone at the gate instead of bringing them in to Des Moines side, of course, the stairway. <sighs> My frustration is that my parents had a boat here. We had a 40 foot Puget trawler and we used to go around through all of the San Juans. And like Wagner's were saying, you know, we are the only ones that have the roof. Uh, we need to keep that. We need to be cutting edge. We need to go way beyond what you guys got there but in a different fashion. Jeff Bezos is actually looking for real estate to put solar panels on. Those, if the, if the roofs were structured properly, could actually go on that. Sure, we have to factor for the dead load, but that could power not only here, 
but it could actually be powered back to the utilities and we get money from that. That could power all of the docks, all of the marina. We could have security set up with it. We could, oh, Christina, I could go I on. Okay, the other one is the property that you wanna sell. My idea for that is that there's the parking lot there. Why? Because Seattle added, inadvertently did us a big favor by doing that $12 an hour. We could actually put the parking in there. Security could be in there. The um, elevator could be there. I, I, I can show you a whole thing. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. Yes, I know that I only have three minutes. You guys have been doing really well. You do need to bring the, the actual people of Des Moines proper into this. They will Thank help. You. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Mayor, next we have Ann Craker. Ann Craker, are you out there? Yes, I am, and thank you for saying my name right. I appreciate that. And also, I'm showing you what happened in our neck of the woods here. So, um, uh, what the the waterfront is also very um, it is critical for all of us, all up and down Des Moines. And um, I'm speaking this I, I, uh, on your marina development. I don't know what number that is to refer to uh, in your agenda. Um, but just like the last speaker said, the public has not been involved enough in this process. And especially during pandemic times, I know uh, before, quite right before it started, uh, Mr. Matthias was saying, hey, we want your input. And they're like, well, I guess we're not going to be meeting inside and maybe we could meet outside. And this has been really difficult to get a full set of public process, um, whether or not you had it set up. So I would say for sure, um, continue it, hold off, keep on trying to get more, uh, get, a get a plan out there uh, that you can get input in uh, from all the different points of view. Mine would be climate change. We have to deal with the fact that we are first and foremost hitting this. This would not be over our wall uh, with, with rocks halfway up the yard uh, three times last year, now this year again, um, if it hadn't had eight inches of uh, sea level rise and in the last 50 years, and it is increasing. Um, the, the stormwater runoff, as we well know, we are getting these storms that are, uh, can't, our, our, our old systems can't handle them. We need natural sources to, uh, natural ways to look at this. Um, uh, solutions, I think is what they call it. And I don't believe that a developer has that in their best or interest uh, that what will hit the, um, that what happens to the people who live there and who live in the city uh, care the most. And um, I, I, I guess that's what I would like to say is that we not only need a larger process, but we need it to um, uh, be longer, to be able to include more people, especially as we are hoping that we get to be um, more together uh, in, in person in addition to um, virtual and that we have uh, a, the development be um, appropriate for what our region, our, our actual waterfront is, is seeing with stormwater runoff meeting sea level surge, and that will only be increasing. So thank you also for uh, letting me comment tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Mayor, the other three who signed up didn't get on the call. Can I read their comment into the record? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Ricardo Vargas, A. Martinelli, City Council Member, Susan White, Council Meetings, and Regina, Regina Puzas, Marina Proposal. And that concludes public comment and correspondence, Mayor. No, no, Laura's here. Laura's here. Excuse me, Laura Heister. Yep, Laura's here. Okay. Sorry. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I wanted to comment on the boutique hotel. Um, I did a little research on the boutique hotel and it takes between five and 100 rooms. Um, it, need, it has distinct char characteristics and it's a destination spot. It has six requirements. It's a smaller in size, unique in characteristics. Um, it gives a lot of attention to design. It's located in fashionable areas. 
Um, it has personalized services and great selection of things to do. Okay, in that realm of uh, thought process, the great selection of things to do. Yes, Des Moines is an amazing place for us to live, but we don't have a downtown. I mean, um, there's not much downtown for people to do. The dollar store, mm, the Wendy's, mm, there's a lot of old people to visit at the places which are very pretty and amazing. Um, there's kayaking, there's a few trails. Um, one of my big questions is, if it's gonna be say between 80 and 100 rooms, can our sewer system handle that? That's a really big question. Can the sewer system handle that? Um, and then is the RFQ basically done? If you guys are voting on somebody, is the RFQ done and sealed and delivered? Because in listening to everybody else's comments, I also heard that the property is going to be sold. And I don't know if it's a rumor or if it's a done deal or not. So um, that's a big concern. And I don't feel that the, the people of Des Moines is being involved as much. Yes, this has been a process that's going on for many years. So I just wanted to make those comments and I appreciate you allowing me to talk. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that compl uh, completes our public comment portion of things. And that takes us forward to our city manager's report, um, uh, Michael Mathias. And um, I believe, Michael, you also wanted to make a comment about uh, some of the comments that came in. So the, the, the floor is yours at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Um, yeah, I will um, answer a number of those concerns uh, when the item comes up later on, on the agenda. Um, I wanted to mention you, there will be more to come on our website. We were able um, just today, actually, to um, determine that we are able to uh, continue with our EATS program, providing vouchers for seniors, and that will be effective next week. And, uh, and we'll have more available on the website about that process, but primarily for seniors during the week of Thanksgiving, and then we hope to go on into the holidays and the first two locations that will be available for the vouchers that can be um, acquired at the senior center will be uh, b and &E Meats and also Tuscany Restaurant. So they will be helping with um, Thanksgiving uh, preparations for, for seniors. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is turn this over. I'd like Dan Brewer to make a couple of announcements. Our manager reports and I will be very brief. So when Dan's done, that will be um, all that we have right now. Thank you, Michael. Um, council, uh, I don't know about you. I look forward to being back in chambers. If, if I was in chambers right now with you, I would ask Lauren Reinhold to come up and stand next to me at the podium so you can visualize that. Uh, uh, Lauren, I don't know if you have the ability to turn your camera on, but we'd sure love to see your face here. Um, Council, uh, Lauren is uh, retiring and leaving us. Um, earlier this week, we had a get together um, to kind of celebrate his uh, tenure here at the city. I shared with the group that, um, you know, we have, you know, our top 45 tenured employees all have been here 10 years or more. And our top 25 employee tenured employees have been here 20 years or more. But we only have one employee who's been here for 30 years, and that's Lauren. Lauren has uh, been here for 30 years, serving the city of Des Moines as our surface water manager and uh, uh, Lauren's been such a great team player uh, within engineering and community development and has uh, always done a great job. Uh, he's really going to be missed. Uh, and so I just, Lauren, uh, congratulate you on your retirement and uh, just wish you well. Thank you for uh, coming here on your vacation day, too, so we can say thanks. Or I, I don't know what to say i've had the privilege of working with you for a number of years and you always made sure that we had great information 
you got a lot of interesting questions and I loved your approach. When you went into the question, you made sure we understood it. And no matter how far afield it was one way or the other, you brought us back to center. Um, your work here is gonna last a long time and you're, you, you will live, you will definitely live in my memory and in the hearts of those that you've served with for all those years. Um, I wish you nothing but the best in your retirement and, of, and I wish a very long retirement for you, my friend. Thank you very much for everything. The city is honored to have had you. I see, I see Councilmember Banks. Lauren, I just wanna say thank you for never letting me feel like I was asking a stupid question. And I appreciated all the ways that you did answer them because uh, as a newbie and as one person who didn't know a lot about uh, what the city was all about. I mean, from every staff member, those who are gone and those who are going to come, uh, I would say that they could have taken a lot of tips from you because your patience was phenomenal. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Council, uh, the last item we have uh, tonight is I'd, I'd like Tyler to give us a very brief uh, uh, announcement on some storm uh, storm uh, preparations that the community could help us with. So Tyler, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And thank you, Bonnie. We're getting a, just a one page slide for everyone to look at as well. Um, so this year has been fairly unique with um, just our, our rain events and, and how the hot weather has stayed. So kind of the hot weather from the summer and approaching further into the fall has delayed the leaves from falling um, and, and actually caused them to intermittently fall in, in different phases rather than normally sort of gradually falling. So it's um, put a little bit of a... Uh, maintenance challenge on us. Um, and then, so we worked with our emergency um, preparedness manager, Shannon Kirchberg, to create a social media campaign to just notify the public that leaves are falling. And when they fall, there's ways they can be involved and help us. So um, we, we had three dates where we did um, between October and November, we sent um, social media posts out there, just letting the public know that um, any help with raking leaves on their property that would could blow onto um, the roadway or in their yards or adjacent um, sidewalk or streets are, are a huge help to us just because as, as leaves blow out into the road um, and it rains hard, those get washed over grates and basins and those can easily become clogged and become um, big puddles and larger puddles from there um, to impact traffic and all that. So just we wanted to let everyone know we we have um, a good a great stormwater crew that's on it and doing rounds to keep our, our streets clean but there are a lot of leaves out there um, so we appreciate any help um, with that as well and and if the public does notice um, clogged drains or areas of concern they can always reach us with our public works um, engineering hotline and we have a fix it form online to notify staff of any um, drains that need to be cleared by our crews or anything of that nature. So yeah, again, as Dan said, this is a very brief update to everyone on what we've been doing the last few weeks with managing the leaves. Well, thank you. And I very much appreciate all you guys are trying to do. I mean, those drains get plugged and it doesn't take long before the road is flooded over and everything else. Um, I think it's also important to note that if there is a plug drain and all of a sudden it becomes unplugged, it's important not to hang around them because the, it's a tremendous amount of force that is being sucked into that hole. So um, especially if you have little kids or something that are playing around it, it's, it's, you need to be careful. So Dan, did that conclude uh, the remarks that you had? So Michael, you are, your report is complete, correct? Correct, thank you. Thank you. And now um, will the clerk Please read the consent calendar. Item one, approval of vouchers. Item two, THG LLC consulting contract amendment number one. And that concludes the consent calendar, Mayor. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve 
the, the consent, I see Jeremy, Council Member Nutting. So moved. Second. Uh, second by Council Member Banks. Okay. Does any Council Member wish to remove anything? Okay, not seeing anyone. All those in favor of the consent calendar as read, please raise your right hand and say, um, well, until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Nutting, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney and myself. Okay, this passes 6-0. Okay, this takes us to our first public hearing of the evening. Uh, it has to do with uh, 2022 property tax levies. And we have a staff presentation by our finance director, Beth Ann Rell. Uh, at this point, I will now open the public hearing. Beth Ann, you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Beth Ann Rowe, Finance Director. Um, tonight, the public hearing is to and presentation is our 2022 property tax levy. We go to the next slide, please. Um, I'd like to go over the changes from our 2021 position. Um, for the city of Des Moines, overall assessed valuation has increased by more than 478 million um, to 5 billion, 394 million, 605, 257, which is an increase of 9.724 um, in valuation for the city. Um, the city has also had an additional 35 million of that increase due to new construction. And it adds $38,174 to the overall property tax revenue base. This year, like we did in 2020, or I mean, 2021, we are not including that statutory 1% allowable increase, which would have, um, uh, added an additional $54,000. We um, are requesting to bank that for potentially using it in later years. Um, that would be a decision that could be for the future. And if we bank it, that doesn't mean you have to use it. It's just available. So our proposed tax rate for 2020 is an estimated 1.041, which is a decrease of 6.794% from our previous levy. So our levy rate has decreased and a lot of that is due to the assessed valuation increasing. Um, it's, property taxes are a bit complicated, um, but the amount that we received in 2021, um, the dollar value, we add the new construction, and any increases or refunds and re-levies to that dollar amount. And that dollar amount actually gets spread and divided over that assessed valuation. And because the value's gone up, but the dollar amount has, has increased very little, or I mean, or a smaller amount, that makes our levy rate um, lower than the previous year. So um, next slide, please. So the recent high levy for the city was in 2016 and it was a 1.65. And our proposed levy for 2022, which is at the 1.0041, it's really a 39.25% decrease from that 2016. As you can see, our levy rate's been going down. So um, next slide, please. Um, so our city levy, which is that, I'm sorry, 1.1074 um, in 2021 is only like 8% of the total property tax levy, total levy. And so on the pie chart, I kind of wanted to give you a perspective. You see that the city of Des Moines is in green, which is the eight, eight and a half percent compared to the other portions of our levy, which are for other jurisdictions. Um, 
just a good kind of comparison where we're at. And I know it's difficult because even though our levy rate's going down, sometimes the dollar value on your property tax goes up because it's a combination of all the districts and what's occurring. Um, and that concludes my presentation for tonight. Thank you. It's now time for public comment, the public comment portion of the public hearing. And has anyone signed up to speak? No. Being that no one has signed up to speak, council, do you have any questions? And these must be asked in the form of a question. Okay, <clears throat> one second. I see council member Harris, then council member Bangs. Okay, uh, I'll start with council member Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, Beth Ann, this is my perpetual question. If we bank uh, the 1% for future years, is there a mechanism to uh, deploy that beyond just annually? In other words, uh, I mean, you know, do you, is it like a cumulative thing where we would have to util take advantage of that um, all at once? Or can we do it gradually? Uh, I recognize it's not a large dollar amount overall, but um, yeah. Um, you could use it um, gradually, um, or you could decide to take it all at once. I think it's, it's determinate um, what you have in bank capacity, how much of that you would need. Um, there are some other factors when you go to deploy it with, there's, a lot of complicated calculations that the county performs. So we'd have to work with them to make sure that if you wanted to deploy all the bank capacity that we didn't max out anything. So we would work with them to make sure and ask that question at the time you wanted to deploy that bank capacity, whether you wanted to do it all at once or if you wanted to spread it over time. But that's a fairly, you're saying that's a non-trivial conversation. That's something that would, you know, Require right. back and forth. Okay, Correct. thank you. Councilmember Banks. Uh, Beth Ann, on 22 of the packet, page 22, where all the whereases are, yes. it states that the banking unused levy capacity helps the city of, De of Des Moines general fund reserve stay at or above the minimum reserve requirements. Would this put us at or would it put us above? It would put us above if we had taken the one percent. If we had. If we had. Okay. The bank capacity is off to the side and we don't have that money unless we do a legislative action to increase that property tax in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> seeing no other questions. I will now close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Councilmember Nutting. I move to enact draft ordinance, draft resolution number 21-057, declaring a substantial need for purposes of setting the limit factor for the property tax levy for 2022. Second. Okay, motion made by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by Councilmember Bangs. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand until I call your name. Uh, Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Bangs, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. Passes 6 0. Councilmember Nutting. Move to suspend rule 26A in order to enact draft ordinance number 21058 on first reading. Second. Motion made by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by Councilmember Banks. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. See Councilmember Banks, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. Opposed? Okay, and Councilmember Harris is opposed. This passes 5 1. Councilmember Nutting. 
I move to enact draft ordinance number 21-058, determining the amount of the funds to be raised by ad valerium taxes for the year 2022 for general city expenditures. Second. Ending signed by Councilmember Bangs. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Netting, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. This passes, <clears throat> excuse me, 6 0. Councilmember Netting. I move to suspend rule 26A in order to enact draft ordinance number 21-059 on first reading. Second. Okay, motion made by Council Member Nutting, seconded by Council Member Bangs. All those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Council Member Bangs, Council Member Buxton, Council Member Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney and myself opposed. Councilmember Harris passes five to one. Okay, back to you, Councilmember Nutting. I move to enact draft ordinance number 21-059, authorizing the increase in ad valorem taxes for the year 2022 for general city expenditures. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your right hand until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Banks, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. This passes 6 0. And that now takes us to our second public hearing item. It is the 2022 preliminary annual budget, second reading. Um, staff presentation by Finance Director Beth Ann Rope. Excuse me. I will now open the public hearing. Um, Beth good, Ann. Evening. good evening again. Um, so the public hearing tonight is for the 2022 preliminary annual budget. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, to provide a, uh, an overview of our annual budget for 2022, um, here's the fund types that we have, and we have um, total sources and uses by fund type. Our general fund um, is 29 million, which is about 25% of our total budget. Um, special revenue funds um, are about 21%. Our debt service funds are quite small. Our capital project funds, which include the expenditures, of um, for municipal improvements and transportation, along with um, revenue sources that fund those um, capital projects is um, 30.7 um, million, about 26% of our budget. We have our enterprise funds, which are the marina fund and the surface water fund. And then we have an internal service funds of 8.5 million. And so the total um, budget that for um, appropriations is, 117,546,154. Um, if we go to the next slide. When we presented the budget on October 21st, um, since then we've made some uh, updates and just the, the major ones. Um, we updated staffing le levels to add totals where needed and we updated municipal court and police department. Um, for the new positions and reorg, um, updated the general and exempt pay schedule to correct a step in grade for the senior planner. Um, we updated the extra higher pay schedule, um, set the minimum at the 2022 state minimum wage rate and adjusted the other rates um, from the minimum base. We added detail for the new American Rescue Plan Administration, the ARPA fund. Um, we updated the 2022 expenditure amount for debt service funds, updated the list of capital projects to include the allocation of our ARPA funding for 2022, and we updated surface water fund for an error in a formula that affected the total expenses, and updated equipment replacement fund for the 2022 capital outlay to include ARPA funding and provided a list of vehicles. 
So that's what's changed since we did October um, 2021. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things in our presentation on the 21st that we had mentioned is that we did not have, um, we had just gotten information on our benefits increase. Um, and we, there was for medical premium changes, it, one plan was 1% and then as the, um, another plan was um, 5.8 up to 7.3, depending upon the plan design. And uh, I believe our dental plan was at 2%. And so I've updated the operating expense expenses to um, take into account some of these changes. Um, and then also we had um, planned some cost of living increases in our initial projections. Um, our Teamsters or contract is um, tied to the October CPIU index and that's come in at 6.5%. Um, I um, would like to um, see if Michael would like to add a couple comments regarding our cost of living um, and our process for how we're handling um, that for this year, for 2022. Thank you, Beth Ann. Um, there are a number of factors affecting <clears throat> COLAs. And at the macroeconomic level, the federal government, as a result of COVID and a uh, huge amount of unemployment, um, literally flooded the economy with dollars. And now some of the repercussions of doing that have to do with inflation factors that are rising. So at the local level, what that means for us is that um, 6.5% across our region of uh, cost of living is going to be um, negotiated across all of our, this, our sister cities and agencies with their labor groups. And Des Moines, in order to retain a competitive place in the market, has to, one, address that 6.5% in some manner, and secondly, as Beth Ann mentioned, the Teamsters are locked into that October. They took a risk uh, last year when they went with the October number rather than the June number. Well, if they got, stayed with June, it was 5.3, I believe, this year. And now it's 6.5 in October, but they stayed with October. So that's a contractual um, dynamic that we will have to honor. In terms of other bargaining groups, knowing that that's what the Teamsters are getting, um, we, sorry, ah, I'm sorry, I can't get my phone off. Um, at any rate, so, uh, I'm sorry, the, so we have to um, be competitive and we will be working through that issue with um, our bargaining with the Guild and other, you know, as we have labor negotiations. And also we will look at ways to address the needs of the generals and exempt employees who um, in, it's codified is that we will treat them in a similar manner to our bargaining units. So those are all things that are to come. We will come back to council at some point in the future with budget amendment, depending on what that final disposition of the COLA is across all of the, uh, the employee groups. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Beth Ann. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, um, uh, Michael, may I ask, uh, Chair, may I ask? Not question? at this time, you can't. Um, I will call for questions in a minute, but we're in a public hearing and we have to stick yeah, to the yeah. best okay. for me. Sure. Okay, I'm sorry, Beth Ann, you still have the floor. Um, I believe that concludes my presentation. Okay, it's now time for the public comment portion of the public hearing. Has anyone signed up to speak? No, no, no. Okay, seeing that no one has signed up to speak, I will entertain council's uh, questions from the council. Council, please raise your hand if you have questions to ask. I see council member Harris. I see no one else. Okay, at this point, council member Harris, please ask your question. Thank you, mayor. Um, so it, uh, am I correct that the COLA is uh, negotiated by each union? individually? 
Yes. Okay. And um, is uh, does the Teamsters their contract are that are they always first in line for negotiations? In other words, do they kind of drive the discussion? No, they do not. It's a it's a function of the term of the contract as to which sequence they come in. Okay. Uh, but there's sort of a certain amount of arbitrage involved in that they you you take a gamble um, from their point of view as to what month of the year you're going to uh, uh, you know choose. There's two, and I'm not quite sure you mean by arbitrage. Well, I mean they took a they took a risk, as you said, in terms of specifying which month of the year um, they would use as the uh, you know cost of living. Um, figure from the government, from the feds, right? I, I think I think I said they chose to use October. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Seeing that there are no more questions, I will now close the public hearing. Councilmember Nutting. I move to pass draft ordinance number 21-048 establishing establish excuse me establishing the 2022 annual budget for the fiscal year ending December 31st 2022. Do I have a second? I have a second. I'm uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, did I see your hand? Yes, you did. Okay. Council, before we go into discussion, I just want to make a comment. Um, Councilmember Harris, we know that you've submitted uh, a number of amendments and we recommend that these items be brought back to the council at some point in the first quarter of next year to be discussed at the council's goal setting retreat. So with that, all those in favor of the motion on the table please raise your hand until I call your name. Okay, I've got Councilmember Bangs, uh, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney and myself and Councilmember Harris, passes 6-0. Okay, our final hearing of the night is the 2021 annual budget amendments. We have a staff presentation by our finance director, Beth Ann Rowe, and I will now open the public hearing. Staff will give their presentation, please. Um, Mayor, I'm gonna turn it over to our deputy finance director, Jeff Friend for this presentation. Okay. So, thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and council members. Uh, being that this is a public hearing, I wanted to take a moment to explain why we do budget amendments and then secondly, um, discuss uh, briefly the items that are included in the budget amendments for the 2021 annual budget. So why do we do budget amendments? Um, the reason we do budget amendments is primarily because we create budgets um, before the fiscal year. And so um, state law allows us during the fiscal year to make changes and amendments in order to capture items that we might not have anticipated that might have had a big effect on the city or um, corrections we might need to make. So for example, a global pandemic would be anticipated in a budget process the year before. Uh, so where state law allows us during the fiscal year uh, to amend the budget. And this also helps us make sure that, um, or make it more likely that budget appropriations can cover expended, ex, expected expenditures. I put a tongue twister in my little script, which <laughs> wasn't so smart. Um, anyway, so that's the reason we do budget amendments. It's just um, state law allows it and it helps us cover our expenditures uh, through budget appropriations. So um, I believe there is a slide to go along with this presentation. At this point, uh, we're working we... to get it up. Um, okay. Um, Please give us a moment. Yeah. Um, I can discuss the items in the um, budget amendments before the slide is up. Um, so for the 2021 uh, 
actual budget, which is shown here. So the this schedule on the left hand side shows the 2021 original budget. And then in the middle, you'll see two columns for revenue and expenditures. Those are the changes in budget. So those are the budget amendments that we're presenting tonight. And this shows the effect by fund. So you'll see the top row shows the general fund and the revenue is being decreased in the budget by a little over $1.1 million and expenditures uh, being decreased by almost $500,000. On the right side of the schedule, you'll see the 2021 amended budget. So if these amendments are adopted by council, um, this would be the budget for the 2021 fiscal year. So the items that are included in the amendments uh, in the packet um, would include items such as uh, funds and revenue. Funds, re the city received funds from the American Rescue Plan Act. So we need to, on the accounting side, need to include the revenue and expenditures for 2021 that are related to that. Also on September 2nd, uh, council passed the capital improvement plan. So we need to include that also on the city's books. Um, the third one would be the North Marina parking lot bulkhead project transactions that are, are related to that for this fiscal year. And then there's other adjustments such as um, just uh, <laughs> projections that we can make a little bit more accurate for example, sales tax, we're expecting a little bit more sales tax than we did when we created the budget last year. And then just some boring uh, accounting adjustments, moving something from one line to another. So that's the, the gist of the um, budget amendment items. Um, and as I mentioned, the effect on the funds, if you look at the schedule, um, I discussed the change uh, in the general fund, but for all funds overall together, um, the change in budget would be an increase of revenues of $13.6 million, a little over, and then uh, expenditures would be uh, a little over $10.5 million increase. And so the amended budget, the uh, overall fund balance would be $48,783,158. And that would conclude my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. At this time, it's we are. Um, it's the public. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to try again. It's now time for the public comment portion of the public hearing. Has anyone signed up to speak? No, Mayor. Since no one has signed up to speak, um, Council, do you have any questions? Uh, please raise your hand so I can recognize you. Seeing no questions. I will now close the public hearing. Is there a motion? I see council member nutting. I move Second. to suspend. Oh. Go ahead. <clears throat> I move to suspend rule 26A in order to enact draft ordinance number 21-060 on the first reading. Second. Okay, a motion made by council member nutting, seconded by council, uh, deputy mayor Mahoney. All those in favor, please raise your right hand until I call your name. Councilmember Bangs, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. Opposed? Councilmember Harris is opposed. This passes five to one. Councilmember Nutting. I move to enact draft ordinance number 21 060 <laughs> relating to municipal finance amending the 2021 annual budget adopted in ordinance number 1744. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Nutting, second by Councilmember Mahoney. All those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Bangs, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, and myself. This passes 6 0. Okay, that completes our public hearings for the evening. Okay, this takes us forward to new business item number one, Marina Development Selection Recommendation. City Manager, Michael Mathias, you have Thank the floor. You, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, appreciate it. So I want to just talk about kind of where we've been and where we're going, what we're recommending. Um, you know, marina redevelopment has been an issue, an active issue involving, you know, citizen groups, community input, leadership for at least 10 years. And the marina has been around for about 50. And um, so in the past, those efforts were not successful. And I won't characterize, I mean, there's many reasons why development doesn't move forward, but it is a complex enterprise to move development forward on any sense of large scale. So Des Moines was blessed with this gem of a marina. And yet one of the main problems that exists in the city is the topography where the marina is separated from the downtown. So one of the crucial elements in marina redevelopment is finding a way to suitably accommodate access and um, circulation between the marina and the downtown. So as, as I've been working on this project for about five years, um, it became clear that one way to address that was to um, conceptualize development of a marina steps. And with great fortune for the city, and you just you know, pass the extension to his contract. We've been able to um, employ the services of Robert Holmes as a consultant. And Robert's uh, resume is too long to go into here, but one of those uh, projects that he worked on and was responsible for was the development of Harbor Steps in Seattle. So we thought the Harbor Steps was, or Marina Steps as they're called, would become a critical element to any marina redevelopment, providing greater access and recreational opportunities and, and just fun for our, for our community and for all the visitors that we get to the marina, which is a huge number. Um, as we were going through this process, and I remember, I remember Council Member Nutting was really, I think, intrepid about this concept, was that as we looked at market demand, opportunities, all of that, um, Council really did not support residential development on the marina floor. And that became a condition of development. So that limited our options as to what else we would, could go there. Um, so creatively working with Robert and our team, Skylab architects and so forth, we looked at what would the investment be from the public sector into marina redevelopment? And then what would a private public partnership look like, which is what's done all across the United States these days. Any kind of development involves public-private partnerships. And um, so we went through this process. We were delayed two years by COVID. Um, in September of 2019, we had about 350 people come to the Yacht Club for an open house on community re redevelopment, marina redevelopment. Um, the architects showed renderings I would say at least 90% of the comments we received were positive, many from um, people residing on the hillside overlooking the marina. Prior to that, we had um, an open community open house on a boat provided by Argosy for the day. So we did a community open house to look at uses. And from then we moved forward to try to establish an RFQ, request for qualifications. So let me explain very clearly what this is. The elements, and many of them were mentioned by some of the people that commented tonight, and I'll just take an example. Sustainability will be a critical component and feature of marina redevelopment. That includes both the green roof. Um, we're looking at 223rd becoming a bioswale street where we could have um, stormwater runoff um, included in, the, in that as, a, as an urban creek but still provide vehicular transportation and pedestrian access. We've looked at providing solar panels on the green roof itself. A number of you uh, council members, we um, showed you uh, a building in Carillon Point, state of the art that uses solar power and has a green roof and does the, we would look at an evapotranspiration channel along the green roof to enhance stormwater runoff. We would open up the stormwater feature 
Um, we would enhance water quality released into the sound. We're looking at electrification if we go forward with any type of ferry service. We're looking at electrification if we have vehicles, you know, internal service vehicles, utilizing um, you know, boat storage, any of that. So as we were looking at marina redevelopment, we were also looking at the water side, dock replacements, what's the appropriate configuration of the marina, all of those things. But let me explain very carefully and very clearly. This is only the first step. What we're asking you to do tonight is we had, we sent out about 2,500 copies of the RFQ. Um, we engaged national um, developers and investors and national associations comprised of developers um, in our distribution. Um, we received responses and inquiries from a number of people who want to develop in Des Moines, not associated with the marina, who want to invest in the downtown. So that, that's a great offshoot of what we've been doing. But in the end, it looked like um, a boutique hotel was going to be uh, the commercial dynamic along with retail. We want to do seasonal um, protection for the farmer's market. So they have a roof over their heads throughout the year. And um, so we went, we received all these responses. And then we went through a very, um, you know, critical evaluation process where we um, judged the proposals we received. And there were three significant ones, one of which withdrew because they, their submittal was dependent on residential development. And we said that is not an option on the marina for this public-private partnership. Not going to happen. So then it was, okay, well, who could come up with a plan that didn't involve residential, since that's usually the heart that pumps the blood into development in many cases. And um, so we received the proposals. You saw the scoring. And so one person withdrew. The other one said they really didn't have experience in development beyond residential as a critical component. So they didn't withdraw, but they were hesitant to proceed. And then we got the third proposal that we were recommending. And so we went through a process, staff, we um, graded the, the, our internal review panel, including myself, graded the submittals. Then what we did was we had interviews with all of our development team and the, the, the uh, private sector development team. Then we took a site visit to the number one uh, group down in Oregon to look at development they've done. And we met with city officials in Independence, Oregon, where there's a hotel along a river they built. And we met with the mayor and the city manager and the, the former city manager, current city manager, economic development person, in the morning, we went to Bend, met with the city manager of Bend, who had similar kind of mixed use options in his city. And so we did a very thorough vetting. And so what, we, what we're recommending is that the city council authorized me to enter into a, an exclusive negotiation agreement with Embarcadero Hospitality. And the basis of that will be to discuss with them what our needs are for the marina, what their proposal looks like, then come to some agreement and, and, and create what's called a development agreement. And that development agreement would need to be approved by council before $1 was spent on construction. So this is, this is a, you know, a, a process to get to the final outcome that we wanna see. And that process will involve public input. So we're not committing to anything right now except to enter into negotiation with this group. There's no money on the table. There's, there, there's no commitments that are legal. It's just an exclusive negotiating agreement where we say we will negotiate with you and no one else until the outcome of those negotiations determine can we work with you or not and can you do for us what we need. That's where we are, nothing more than that. Very significant to do that. And um, so I'm recommending this fully, um, along with our staff. We were very impressed with the uh, Embarcadero Hospitality Group. The thing about that group 
is that any single, there are four different entities, any one of those entities could have submitted a proposal to the city. They decided to band together because the nature of this opportunity that they all recognize of Des Moines as a, as a, a gem of an asset and the development process and that they can live within our requirements, which are height requirements. We need to, um, you know, somebody mentioned the infrastructure. Yeah, we've looked at the utility infrastructure. That will be an issue that we will have to address. We'll have to address financing. The marina steps will be the cities, but we will look at ways to creatively finance that so we can have it built with an integrated design development to the hotel and to any other facilities that we build, even that building to the south. So everything's up for grabs right now in terms of what that discussion looks like with Embarcadero Hospitality Group. But I want to say in closing, and you know, and personally, I've been gratified by the support of the council to get to this point. This is further than we've ever gotten before as a city. This is an opportunity to step forward. And this is the legacy of everyone in this meeting right now. This is what we're going to get. And hopefully it's going to be something really extraordinary. And I think with the level of involvement, experience, and finance available from this group, nothing less than excellent will be the outcome because they have their reputations at stake as well. Okay. So I just want to, I just want to offer one thing I was thinking about this morning, you know, in my career, I was very gratified early on to be selected as a Robert F. Kennedy fellow for my work with low income families in Oakland, California, relative to quality of public education, quality of public health care. And for that reason, I've always honored and loved the, the statements made by Robert F. Kennedy. But I'm going to tell you the one that is his most famous, and I think that applies, is that Robert Kennedy said, you know, some people um, see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see Council Member Nutting. I move to an, approve the panel's recommendation selection from Embarcadero Hospitality Group as the selected developer to move forward with marina de redevelopment and authorize the city manager to enter into an exclusive negotiation agreement with the recommended development team. Second. second. I have a tie on the second, but because Council Member Buxton has not seconded anything, I will give it to her tonight. Um, noting that Councilmember Bangs, you were right in there. So um, at this point, uh, please raise your hand. We move, we move into discussion. I see, okay, wait a second. The hands, oh, I see, I'm sorry. Okay, one second. Um, okay, I got Jeremy. In that order. Oh, say that again. There's Jeremy, Stacy, Lisa, and Mom. Okay, I think I've got you ordered to correct. Uh, <laughs> in as we saw, so the first hand up we saw was. Um, Everybody has raised their hand, by the way. So I'm gonna start with Council Member Nutting. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, City Manager Mathias. Um, it's, it's been a long road to get here. Um, we had proposals and of the very few, um, some of them godly and not of Des Moines, six years ago when we went down this path. Um, we actually got to the table uh, with a developer uh, and they wanted us to fund it after citizens and um, council came together and, and agreed that marina redevelopment was necessary. Um, and for the first time, I am absolutely excited about the way we are moving forward with this. Um, the, the team, I've, I've had a, an opportunity to 
um, talk to all of them on the Argosy cruise for the foot ferry. And um, they, they absolutely have Des Moines in their best interest and the citizens of Des Moines. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited to move forward with this. I hope we can come to an agreement and, and thank you staff and, and uh, city manager Matthias and council for going along. This is, this has been an amazing opportunity and, and I hope at the end of this, we, we've got something, I, I know at the end of this, we will have a, a jewel down there, uh, another jewel to add to what we already have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I am thrilled about this opportunity. I mean, there's hardly been a more important decision I feel like that I've made since the beginning of service on this council than this one tonight. And I believe it's the beginning of a turning point for our city. I have to say, uh, though, honestly, just a little bit candidly that I was a little dismayed to begin receiving confusing emails this morning. And I believe some incomplete information has been disseminated out into the community. And I appreciate the detail that was attended to tonight in this presentation. Thank you, City Manager Matthias, a great job. Uh, after speaking though, just even this morning before this presentation, after speaking to one person over the phone for only about five minutes, they totally understood what we were doing here and flipped their complaint into anticipation. So instead of calling all my corresponders, uh, personally, one at a time, uh, I'll summarize my conversation just to add to what's already been, uh, been presented. We are working to develop an urban waterfront destination that will enhance our quality of life in Des Moines by creating opportunities for business, retail, entertainment, recreation, and education with sustainable water features and a farmer's market for our residents and for our region. The team that we're partnering with has developed a few of the most beautiful and successful urban waterfront projects that you'll find anywhere, let alone the Puget Sound. Their projects include, already mentioned, Harbor Steps in downtown Seattle, North Pike Place expansion, sustainable ur urban surface water features with development in South Lake Union, and the entire Port uh, Point Ruston project, which includes all of the elements of opportunity that I mentioned a moment ago. Not only is this team talented and brilliant, forward thinking, with plenty of resource, they're excited to work with us. A couple of them have been, have been connected to our vision over several years and have been following our progress moving toward this. So yes, we've been moving toward this for several years, several councils, each taking the baton, following the vision of a previous council and their community engagement and moving forward. So are we already mentioned, are we voting on specific structures and buildings tonight? No. We are engaging the most energetic, bright, and successful professionals available to help us make some of our municipal dreams come true. <laughs> and so if you don't, you know, if you don't believe me, Google them. And if that's not good enough, personally call me for another five minutes. And when I'm done, you'll be buying pavers for a sidewalk down there. I mean, I am so sold on this. So I, I'll say it again. I'm thrilled. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, see, this is the thing. Believe it or not, public, I'm like a super nice guy. And what happens is there's always this pressure that builds up because I'm trying to, I never learned how to, uh, yeah, so here's the thing. Um, I went back and did a brute force search of all our council meetings, and I can find no actual decision point about boutique hotel. Um, you know, there's this kind of idea, well, we're not making a decision and everything, but the train has been moving in this direction for quite some time, and it's disingenuous to talk about how nothing's been decided. This whole thing, every element of it is like five, six years old, but there's never been any like, okay, this is the deal. 
it's always left like, no, nothing's being decided. Um, I am not sold on the concept of a boutique hotel as a serious revenue driver. And I believe that there should have been a presentation by a, like a for reals economist who came in and said, that 30,000 square foot, that's the best bang for your buck in terms of structural revenue uh, on an ongoing basis. So putting aside, you know, aesthetics and all of that, I'm like, okay, is this really going to be the best long-term revenue driver for that space? And apart from any other, uh, you know, wonderful qualities of the group, the truth is the players that are being voted on are people that we have talked to many times. I've heard these names mentioned over the years. So I don't think that this has been a totally objective deal. And last but not least, I guess my uh, point is, oh yeah, if I, apart from the fact that we haven't had a chance to talk to them, it's, we've only had this information for five days, uh, at the end of the day, you know, you got to be patient. If you really feel, as I do, that this is the gem, this is the money, the most valuable thing, and that we, this Des Moines waterfront is just, it's just, you know, an amazing part of Puget Sound, which makes it one of the most amazing spots on the planet. Um, if you only get one legit proposal, I mean, think about what your mother would tell you about getting married, all right? Just wait, all right? There's this tone of desperation, like, oh my God, you know, we're never going to get, you know, this is the best we can do. This is not the best we can do. There should be at least two legit proposals that we have not talked to before. And if it takes a while, it takes a while. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Banks. Well, I don't know what to say, but uh, I'm gonna keep it positive. I would say that Council Member Buxton and Nutting uh, did a great job in explaining exactly where we've been, what we've done and where we need to go. If we continue down this path that we've gone down for the last 20 plus years, we're still going to look the way we look. We're still not going to have anything that people that uh, live around me, as a matter of fact, young people with children, can't go somewhere to enjoy. Even though they go to the parks, they, they go to the, you know, the walking paths, they want something down at the marina that they can enjoy as a family. This is one way to do it. And nobody's saying anyone is gonna be putting a shovel in the ground. This is about an opportunity. And for those who are naysayers about the opportunity, that's half the problem we have in this city. The other half very rarely say anything, but I know they're excited too. I'm voting for this. I think it's exciting. I think we need to move forward. I would like to be able to live another 10 years and see this happen. But I don't want to wait another 10 years to not see it happen. So Mayor, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Mayor. I think this is about what you can, what you, you can control versus what you can't. I heard uh, comments about the fact that uh, we didn't have a downtown that could support an enterprise like this. And I kind of think of it as which came first, the chicken or the egg. In this particular case, we can develop the marina and the downtown will follow. As you heard from our city manager, many, many investors were interested in development in downtown because of the investment we were willing to do to the marina. We can, as, as Councilmember Banks said, we can look like 1962. And this is why I came on this council was to kick this forward. And it has to go forward. Otherwise, we're in that definition of insanity where we do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And we're back at it, quite frankly. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. 
what I think people should be doing is not looking at this negatively or it's going too fast or et cetera, is, hey, how do we get involved? When do we get to say our say? When do we get to share our input? That is going to be the key and that's going to happen. This is the step where that happens, quite frankly. This is where we're locking down with somebody who's gonna move us forward. If you've been to Ruston Way, and I've been all over the sound, marinas and so forth, diving, and I see hotels and so forth there, and they're a definite plus. Let me just talk as somebody who studies business. A boutique hotel or something like that is a definite positive. Not only do you get some new people to stay hundreds a week, but they eat in your, your restaurants. They shop in your shops. They give additional reason for people to come here. And being this close to the airport is a fantastic opportunity for us to take advantage of positive impact rather than many of the negative we take. So with that said, you know, of a, I think that this is a great program, at least to move forward. I've met some of these individuals myself. I've taken tours. Discussions about whether we sell the property or lease it or so forth will come forward in the future, right? But I can say this, a lot of investors, you sell to them, they're a lot more inclined to make a bigger investment than the lease. And a typical lease, by the way, folks, would be about 99 years, which is essentially selling them the property. Anyway, with that said, this is dynamic. This is why we came here and this is the step. I, I would like to know, just out of curiosity, how many actual submissions we did get for the RFQ. And uh, I know that there were probably the, at least the one that didn't want to put a boutique to a hotel or they wanted to put some kind of residential. So if you, you might answer that question, I'd appreciate it. But I am for this. This is what we're, this will be further than we've ever been on this in the city. Thank you. De Deputy Mayor, if I may. Um, so we received, I don't know, probably, five dozen inquiries, direct inquiries, uh, probably 20 or so expressions of interest. We've assembled a list of vacant parcels in the downtown and elsewhere. We've distributed those. We've done some tours with people interested in developing um, in Des Moines. In the end, um, we had... We had a number of discussions with people on the phone in terms of what was required when they realized there was no residential allowed uh, and that there were other constraints, height limits and so forth, uh, a specific uh, size of parcel. One, one developer wanted to submit, but they wanted to take 30,000 square feet. We'd identified and turned it into 62,000. We said, no, sorry, that won't fly. So in the end, I think we received at least the three formal proposals. And one of them was once again, contingent upon residential thinking they could change our mind, but we held fast to the direction from the council. And, you know, just for the record, in October, probably September 26th of 2019, council approved us moving forward to, sub to uh, uh, develop and distribute a request for qualifications with stipulations in that discussion as to what the components would be relative to residential height, all of that. So yeah, there has been direction to move forward. Um, but that's, I think that answers your question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, okay. That concludes. I got a few that I, I'd like to, boy. Um, I've been here for almost, almost 12 years. This is the third time in 12 years that comes to mind where we have met with the public, we've talked about the marina, we've talked about potential plans, we've tried to find developers to do it and never happen. The question came about a real economist. I would argue that our city manager if you look at his credentials, qualifies as a real economist. Um, the Boutique Hotel has always been mentioned as a possibility. Um, we all know that at some point there's got to be an economic driver to make these things work. Because if people are going to put money out, they have to get a return on their investment. If they don't get a return, then they're not going to do it. Um, 
And what the what the city, one of the problems the city had in the past was we want to develop our marina, but we want to tell you what we want you to build and we want you to put the money out. We want you to do it. And then we want to enjoy the benefit of it. And I hope you do well in your return, but never worked. Um, you know, people are concerned about that lot as to whether or not we sell it or not. Well, let's just look at it this way. It's a public private partnership. In lieu of cash, the city's got to put something into this par partnership. Maybe that piece of land is the right thing to put in to make this thing work. There are many ways to do it, as Deputy Mayor Mahoney said, but that gets figured out as we, as we go forward with this. The design ideas were have been actually the renderings, it, it's somewhat surprising to me when people say, we've not been involved, we've not heard about this. You know, I've done state of the city presentations for at least seven years. And I've done them from Woodmont to North Hill and every place in between. And I've had various council members and staff with me throughout the entire thing. If you go back to April 15th, we did a state of the city presentation and there were, there are pictures and renderings of potential in, of, of marina design there. We've always talked about this because the truth of the matter is it has to be redeveloped to be that gathering place, to, be the, to remain a working marina that can sustain itself and to be a regional attraction. When you talk about the RFQs and how we need more, we need more. Well, I've been through something like this when I was on the school board and we were rebuilding schools and we hadn't done anything in the district in a long time. We would oftentimes, we'd put out the RFQ and we might just get a couple qualified people only to find out that there are very few people that could make the project work within the confines of what we have to deal with. This is a marina and it's a very unique development. And when you take residential out of it, it makes it even more challenging and unique. You have height restrictions within so, so much, within a certain distance of the shoreline. City Manager Mathias has laid out the plan. We have seen architectural renderings and so forth. There's a ton of misinformation that people keep interpreting and putting out in blogs and and on, the, on, and on the internet. And I'm gonna tell you folks, that if you, if you contact the city and you ask to see what the renderings are, you will see them. This is opening the door to, not, to, to having a viable marina and to having that gathering place. The marina deliberately connects to our, through to our beach park where we have so many events and so many things going on. This is, bringing it together and creating an attachment to the downtown. This also gives us the opportunity to have potentially a, through another public private partnership, foot ferry traffic between Seattle, Des Moines and Tacoma. If you work in Seattle or Tacoma, what an awesome opportunity. It takes about 20 minutes. The trial run gave us the blessing of orcas swimming alongside the boat, Wi-Fi, um, so you can do your work if you need to. I mean, and you're not dealing with traffic. I know what choice I would be making, especially when I did work downtown and the parking was over $300 a month. So I just wanna say, I'm, I'm very much, in, in favor of this. And the process has been, and will continue to be public and will continue to do what is, it, it, to, to move forward in a way to create this very well-developed jewel that will be ours to own and share for decades to come. But it takes, you've got to work with people and the, it's not cheap. And you got to give a little to get a lot. And I think the staff has done an excellent job. 
I think Robert Holmes has done an excellent job. I think we are very fortunate to have the people working with us that we have today. And I know change is hard and people get afraid. Don't be afraid. You're listened to. And this will be a place you are proud of. So, Mr. Harris, you'd like a second crack? Yeah, you betcha. Uh, so um, the RFQ was uh, 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 issued on September the 1st. So they, uh, you know, the contestants had about 35 days or so. And then um, there was a, uh, apparently about a three week, two week window for interviews and presentations. So basically they had, you know, 35 days or so to submit and then two weeks for the staff to review that. The council was not part of any of that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the, you know, I'm looking at what's at the website. And so um, it's just, you know, it's too fast. I get that life is frustrating. I, I get it. There have been people have taken several whacks at that. I fully agree. Um, but um, basically, the uh, vendor was pre-selected. It's people that you've all interacted with over the years. And so this strikes me as pro forma. And um, again, I just, it's like, why boutique hotel? You know, how does that connect the community and the children and the happy people and so on? Um, is that the economic driver that, you know, moves along dock that is sufficient for dock replacement? If you add up all of these wonderful things, do they pay for the docks? And the answer is absolutely not. Nobody can say otherwise. And finally, I was a physics major. And I don't remember any Newtonian mechanics that says that, you know, we have to do this. There's no pressure on us at all to make this decision now, other than just frustration that previous councils didn't get it done. Frustration about the past is no reason to go ahead with something that is not, as I said, epic. What I want, what I think the public should want is basically a skyline. When you're out at the center line in Puget Sound and you look at the, our city, you should see something marvelous. That's going to be the draw for the next 50 years. It's got to be just marvelous. That's going to be the thing that makes people want to come here and spend money. Anything less is going to be like, yeah, you know, okay, it's a, it's a place. Thank you. Mayor, if I may, if I may. Um, Mr. Harris, uh, in order to uh, minimize our liability, let me state that the developer was not pre-selected. It was a fair, transparent process relative to developer review. And there was no pre-selection, which implies that it was unfair and dishonest. And I do not accept that. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Council Member Harris is right. If you want the city to remain the same and look like 1962. You know, I, I can't. I, I am going to call for the vote here in just just a second, but I, I'm not going to let those comments slide. Um, your conspiracy theory around pre-selected bidder, they had to qualify. There was a process. Many people researched it, people put into it. And the fact is, you are misleading the public with that statement. On, in terms of a boutique hotel or anything else that goes down there, there is such a thing that I, being a physics major, I'm sure you should understand, although this is more in the realm of finance, it, there's a thing called return on investment. And the bottom line is, if somebody's going to invest, they expect a return and something has to generate that, turn, that return. So I'm telling you, again, I am really, really frustrated by the way you choose to misrepresent things to the public. And I'm not gonna stand for it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it my comment tonight and then I'm calling the vote. All those in favor of this motion, 
please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, myself. Opposed? Councilmember Harris. That concludes that element. We move on to new business with the 2022 vehicle purchase and we will have a staff presentation from Brandon Carver. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, no, no PowerPoint to go along with this item. Uh, over the last few years, um, and I'll be pulling from the agenda packet directly, but over the last few years, uh, to get a, the, the vehicle purchase process, especially when it comes to police vehicles, for example, can take several months and uh, we found in, in previous years, if we waited till January to actually make the purchase, um, we, we still didn't receive vehicles till maybe uh, May, June, and then we have to outfit the vehicles. And so uh, the last few years, we've been coming to the council for sort of pre-approval on ordering vehicles. We don't take delivery till 2022. I know tonight the budget was passed. And so the item before you is, again, uh, seeking council uh, approval to make make the purchases uh, ahead of the uh, turn of the year so that we can get in the queue, so to speak, uh, especially right now as uh, supply chain issues tend to slow down uh, delivery of, um, of vehicles. Uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, again, um, primarily uh, these vehicles have been funded by the uh, 501 vehicle replacement fund. In addition, there's $377,000 towards uh, uh, six vehicles that will be paid for by the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And uh, both Dan and I are able to answer questions, uh, but trying to keep the presentation brief. Um, at this point, before we go into discussion, I am calling for a motion and I saw uh, Council Member Nutting's hand. I move to approve the purchase of vehicles identified in attachment one for a total estimated amount of $905,000 and to authorize the city manager or the city manager's designee to sign the purchase order at the time they are created. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Councilmember Nutting, seconded by Councilmember Banks. Discussion? Please raise your hand. Uh, okay, I see Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, Brandon, were, was there any research done as to uh, purchasing a hybrid or all electric vehicle? And if so, what the cost differential might be? Um, we we have yes we have been making efforts to uh, especially with our building uh, you'll see one of the vehicles is a Ford Ford Escape hybrid um, and so where it makes sense we have been looking at hybrid vehicles uh, we're not at the point we'll, uh, for all electric uh, some of the service vehicles you see as far as public works uh, the electric vehicles and hybrids are just not there yet for the horsepower that's needed. Uh, and we have done some uh, research into police vehicles and that hasn't been, um, most agencies have not made that move just because they want the, they still want the high performance out of uh, gas vehicles. Although there, we do look at hybrid options when, when presented. And like I said, there's at least one vehicle in this fleet that, that is a hybrid. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, and myself. Opposed? Councilmember Harris opposes. So that goes down 5-1. That concludes that item. Okay, council, our last new business item tonight is draft resolution 
21-056, the censure of council member Anthony Martinelli. Before I begin, I'd like to ed educate everybody on what a censure really is. The council has the authority to pass a resolution as stated in rule 24 of the council rules. A resolution is a formal statement of policy concerning matters of special or temporary character. A censure is a long held power utilized by elected government bodies and allows a body to not only self-govern, but also to speak for itself by addressing and denouncing conduct of members that it deems inappropriate. A censure provides a public record disapproving of an official's actions and is an expression of disapproval by a body of one's elected peers. A censure does not impede a council member's ability to act as an elected official. Rather, the censure acts as an attempted check on a council member's conduct in an effort to, cur to curtail future unprofessional acts of misconduct. And so I will make the motion. I move to adopt draft resolution number 21-056 to formally censure council member Anthony Martinelli. Second. Take the uh, De uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, you haven't had a second tonight, so I'm gonna give it to you. Okay, is there any discussion at this time? Okay, I see Council Member Harris, Council Member Bangs, Council Member Buxton. Let me see. Council Member Mah or Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Okay, Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would like to make a motion. I request that the, or I move that the entire police report be excised from the packet, pages 195 to 350. And I request that items five and six be excised from the resolution. Do I have a second? Seeing that there is no second, the motion fails. Okay, this takes me to council member Banks. Just a, a quick comment, Mayor, and I know that uh, we've had a number, a number of people writing in to ask uh, Anthony Martinelli to step down. Um, I'm not sure where that's going because it really has to be a recall vote. People need to understand that. Uh, I would like to to basically say that there isn't one person on this council who takes this, these actions, this entire report that we have read through lightly. We certainly don't at any time want the victim to feel like she has been laughed at or talked about. I don't know where that's coming from. But all we can go by is the facts, and the facts were all in writing. And I would say that any victim of abuse, no matter what kind, should be able to go to their police department, if necessary, city council member, even though it would be a police matter, and feel comfortable that they would be safe. So I, for one, have worked with many, many, many abused children in the city of New York. And I'm gonna tell you something, they didn't have a voice. And regardless, what made me angry was that the parent who could have said something didn't. And in this case, there was a parent that did. And you have to commend that parent. So all I'm saying is that this city council is not taking it lightly. I wish we could remove Anthony Martinelli, but we cannot. So I would be in favor of this 20 times over. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Buxton. Uh, I, I would, oops, something just came up in front of my screen. Could I go last because I have an amendment to propose? Or I, should, if I do, should I, is it fine if I, Put forward right now. I will go. I will go to the next person. Was uh, 
Deputy Mayor Mahoney. So I will go to him and then come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> you, I'm not gonna pretend I'm the expert on domestic violence. Um, reading through the materials, I was just grateful how healthy my relationship was is, is with my bride and other individuals I have. One of the things though, is this is not a normal domestic violence case that I do know. And it's because it involves a public figure. It also involves social media where the victim and the suspect both control different, different aspects of social media and control the message. Many other people have villainized the council. Some, and I've listened to you as well for taking our action. This is an unprecedented issue in this case, and it's not something we enjoy. It's where we're, this is what we're obligated to do is step up and be responsible in this case and serve the community the, in its best interest, along with every individual. And it's tough. Now, I don't like the police report being in there, I'll be candid, but because of the misinformation put out, it has to be there, it has to, because unfortunately, the truth wasn't being, wasn't being given to our community and our residents, which they have the obligation to know when it involves a public figure. And I apologize that that had to be, but you have to understand why. With that, there is only one person in my opinion that's responsible for this action. And one of the biggest challenges in our nation is people taking responsible for their actions. And that is Mr. Martinelli that needs to do so. There is, he, he is the catalyst of this issue. He is the cause. And he alone could have made this a lot simpler process. And it's on him. If you choose to choose us as the villains, well, then you've done it and you own it. But that wouldn't be the case and that wouldn't be the truth. Thank you. Council Member Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I am and have been uncomfortable with some of this process and verbiage, but I'm in favor of the censure. So for those who feel the same way as I do, I'm gonna take a few moments here to clarify what I understand as our responsibility. Uh, just some of these things helped me. Um, this city council has a measure of a rule or influence, which mostly includes policy and at times quasi-judicial proceedings that require us to weigh information and make decisions based on the information we have. In this case, public information has been made available to us because we're citizens. As a body, we've reviewed this information and have made a decision based on information that we that's out there. So we have no power to make a verdict of guilty or innocent in a court of law, but we do have a responsibility of measuring information that we believe to be true and then responding appropriately to that information. We needed to consider that innocent until proven guilty, you know, the, the quote, refer, refers purely to a very limited number of criminal charges. But what about the rest of the uh, public information that we've been exposed to? There is enough current information for two judges to deem this person worthy of arrest, a few days in jail, a substantial bail, and an ongoing protection order. So these things don't prove him guilty of criminal charges, but they do indicate a life that needs intervention and that people need protection. So our response as a council has nothing to do with criminal conviction or acquittal. We have simply been made aware that a colleague is having personal challenges that we believe are not suited to the responsibilities that he holds on this council. Even if a court delivers a verdict of not guilty to a few charges, this body still has a responsibility to respond appropriately to information that's on the metaphorical table. People do not have to break the law in, in order to be deemed ill-suited for many things, but especially 
the public representation of an entire community. So we as a body do not have the power to remove his office, but we can reduce his responsibilities as we feel appropriate. That said, I'm in favor of this censure, but also in deep distress over the accompanying document or attachments to the censure, which appear in this packet. So even more than advocacy for a partner here, I'm advocating on behalf of all victims present and future that they will have as little to overcome as possible in separating from and in testifying against their abusers, abusers and perpetrators. Victims know that their information becomes available via public records requests, but I don't want to make it even easier for the average citizen to just obtain this record particular, this particular record by attaching it to our packet, which is posted on our website. So I'm going to make a motion before we vote on the censure. Here's my motion. I move to amend the draft re resolution upon passage to remove attachments one, two, and three from the council packet and the censure and replace them with a notation that the attachments may be available by submitting a public records request to the city clerk. Is That's my motion. Did you want me to repeat the motion? I think the council heard it. Is there a second? I have a question. Yeah. Yes. You, 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 council member Buxton, you wanted the censure to be removed from the packet? No. I want to amend the draft resolution after we pass the censure. I want the draft resolution to remove the attachments one, two, and three from the council packet and the censure. So remove the attachments from the, pan from the packet and the censure and replace them with a notation that the attachments may be available by submitting a public records request to the city clerk. Okay, um, Councilmember Buxton, mm -hmm. your motion the second time you read it was a little different. In, okay. in uh, let, let me let me try something here. All right. In the in the resolution, it references attachments at various places. Those attachments are the pat the the, the um, arrest report. Right. Right. The police report. And, and the police report. And what? You're asking is you want to get the police report to be handled by public records request. Yes. So we leave the word attachments, one, two, three, whatever, but we put an asterisk in the resolution that says these, these attachments must be obtained by public records request through the city clerk's office. Correct. So that so that you can't see them just by going to our website either either by looking at this packet or by reading the censure. The censure stands. The censure stands. Okay. Correct. And I second. Okay. Um, I would like to offer an additional um, amendment in that, but I think we have to deal with it with the one that's out there. So we have the one on the on the table right now as where wherever it says attachment in the in the current center there will be an asterisk that says to obtain this attachment you place a public records request to the city clerk's office and then we will remove the police report from the packet okay so and that's what's been seconded so let's let's vote on that right now all in favor please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, and myself. Opposed? Councilmember Harris opposes. Okay, the other thing that I would like to change is that notice of the censure needs to be appropriately communicated to our elected officials and so forth because Doing it is one thing, making sure it's appropriately communicated and the people that we work with all the time really understand what we have done and why. 
So I'm asking that notice of the censure uh, once it's passed be sent to our elected officials who represent the, the residents of the city of Des Moines. That's my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Discussion. Councilmember Harris. Well, first of all, Councilmember Buxton, it's <laughs> funny thing. Uh, yeah, uh, which was pretty much exactly the same thing that I proposed. How about that? Um, I just want the uh, public to understand that it is the mayor who prepares the agenda. None of us saw that uh, report being included. At least I don't think so. Um, so, and as far as, in, you know, saying it was necessary to have that report in there. Um, no, it was not at all necessary. And uh, my dear colleague encouraging people to go out and get it is, you know, this is shameful to me. It, it, it will discourage victims from coming forward in the future. You can bet that. Um, and the reason I wanted, uh, uh, items five and six excised is that for the public, the idea is to distribute this as far and wide to media outlets. Woohoo! More people. Okay. And these people being professional journalists, they will go and look at the police report and more spread. Okay. This is not good for the woman and her child. And I don't know what else to say, but um, at the risk of how this is gonna sound, I had nothing to do with this. Thank you. Council Member Harris, I am gonna tell you right now, when an item is put on the agenda that the council has to vote on, there is also, there is always supporting document. If we were to move forward with the censure without any content, the public would not have, would not understand why we were censuring. Your attempt to make this political is, again, I, I cannot understand how you continually mislead the public, but I'm just telling you, I'm correcting the record and that's where it stands. So all those in favor of the, the amendment that I just added that was seconded by Deputy Mayor Mo, uh, Mahoney, please raise your hand until I call your name. Okay, I see Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Nutting, and myself opposed. I see Councilmember Harris. Do I have an abstention? Yes. Okay, so, uh, Councilmember Buxton, as long as you realize by council rule, an abstention is just a no vote. I just didn't have enough time to think about this, Mayor. It just it was sprung on me, so I abstain. I'm sorry. But it's, no, I like just want you to know that's how it will process. That's all. So it passes four to two. Okay. We are back to our original motion. All those in favor of the censure, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Bangs, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, myself. Opposed? Councilmember Harris. Censure passes. Five to one. Okay. We will now go to board and committee reports. And we start tonight with Council Member Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. So I, I did want, I just noticed something that, you know, ha has happened in the past uh, in regard to public hearings and uh, so the suspension of Rule 26A. And one of the reasons why that is, there's a resistance to the suspending that rule, but the very next rule is a rule that gives you permission to do that. And so I think for clarity's sake and for the community's sake, we're not trying to when we suspend it, it's just it, it's just moving the process along. You know, government has a tendency to feel like you're dragging a bag of bowling balls sometimes to get something done. And uh, so it's not suspending. So in my opinion, it's not suspending 26A so much as accommodating as, you know, in accordance with 26B. 
this is what we're doing. So just, they're both rules. And so you're following a rule when you suspend 26A, you're just following 26B. Just thought I would uh, put that out there. Okay, so uh, there, I attended the Maritime High School grand opening. What a, fab, I, what a fabulous little experience, even though it was on Zoom. I was so impressed with the caliber of the young people and their excitement in this. And we are uh, I'm thrilled to host their floating classroom down at the marina. Um, it's the, I think it's the Captain Jack, I think is the name of the, the boat. And uh, honored to partner with Highline Schools and this group of incredible future industry leaders. They, they were really impressive, great experience. Uh, our city, I received a, a community builder award from ANU down in the Valley. It's our workforce training program that we sent ARPA funding down there and they just appreciated our partnership and our appreciation so much. So they gave us a community builder award and I attended that that ceremony and event and and uh, that was a great experience as well so that's all i have tonight thank you thank you uh council member banks thank you mayor just a brief report i've only attended uh one committee meeting i don't think i reported on this because we didn't have a meeting last week um so the arts commission they did squitterama um I don't have any update from that, but probably next time. Uh, they are getting ready to pull their retreat together for 2022, um, which sounds like it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, and then we had a long discussion about the artwork that uh, artists, path, I believe I'm saying it right, Pathé, the artwork that we have um, and the city has asked us um, what we wanted to do with it. So that's in, in discussion right now. I mean, there's some huge pieces, bigger than most of our walls in our houses. Um, so I'm excited to hear what, uh, what the commission is gonna do about that. And then the utility box um, call for artists is moving forward. Um, we set some parameters around that based on, you know, our city and what we wanted to see. We'd, you know, don't necessarily want a rocker on a on one of our utility boxes. I mean, maybe we do. I don't know. Um, and then they went in for chair, vice chair, and co-vice chair nominations. But we do, I believe, have two uh, interested parties coming forward to you, hopefully, in the next uh, meeting for you to approve. Uh, I'm hoping that moves forward anyway. So that's uh, that. That's it for my uh, my report this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Nutting. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I I don't have very much of anything. Um, no committee meetings. Um, the Mount Rainiers uh, football team they did go to the playoffs. Uh, didn't do too well, and I believe that was in Washougal. Um, but very exciting news, as you know, my daughter was on the C team for volleyball. And um, the varsity girls volleyball for uh, Mount Rainier has gone to state, is in state tomorrow for the first time in 20 years, first time in 20 years in Yakima. And uh, just wish them luck and hope they do well. And uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Councilmember Harris. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so um, I was, um, yeah, I was able to have a presentation. Uh, it made me feel very special by Washdot about SR 509, the segment going from Des Moines Creek Trail, um, basically out to 188. They have a beta video and presentation that is very much like I what I hope we can do with the. Uh, marina you fly over it and you can get a sense of the overpasses and the elevations how it will impact the neighborhoods like blueberry lane it, it was just great and um, they've asked to come and present uh at the uh, start of the year and i sure hope we do that uh, i attended the veterans day uh celebration at sunnydale elementary that was the 100th anniversary of the uh living road of remembrance and uh 
it was tremendously moving. Um, uh, and uh, as I mentioned at the Environment Committee meeting, um, for the first time in many years, there are actually salmon uh, to be counted in several of the creeks. I don't know why all of a sudden, but um, on one day we saw six specimens, um, which is six more than usual. So um, yeah, go salmon. Um, there will be the annual bazaar at St. Philomena Church this Saturday, um, which is usually pretty popular. Um, okay, so the amendment thing, <laughs> which uh, this is the rhetorical part. Um, yeah, I was asking for $41,000, not a great deal to ask. I wanted the money, which got short circuited. And I was a really nice guy. I didn't make a fuss about it, but I wanted to get the website fixed. OK, it's 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 not good. And I tried being nice like everybody wants me to. And uh, so I wanted some, you know, things like that. Um, with regard to Rule 26, a I you'll you'll notice I never um, vote for that because basically because most of the time when we vote on things, I, I you know every single time I get at least a couple of messages saying, wow, that's the first I heard of that. So the, the reason, even though it slows down the process, um, I, I always want uh, another uh, reading is basically to give people another swing at the bat. The meeting, the, the, the first vote is usually the first time a lot of people have heard about it. Um, and um, uh, with regard to uh, Lauren Reinhold, yeah, the guy, you, the public, everybody knows our staff, they're like an encyclopedic in their knowledge of the city. And so I wish him all the best, but a chill is going up my spine at, uh, you know, the thought of the institutional knowledge transfer. Um, it's just a, a big thing. Um, I wish him all the best. Uh, finally, I wish, you know, with regard to the hotel and all of that other jazz, I mean, you guys weren't going to get off easy on this. I feel like I was gentle. Everybody should find some way to look at the city from the water. That is the view. If you look at New York, Seattle, Detroit, you know, um, every city has just this marquee view. If you go on Google, and you look for pictures of Des Moines, they're always from the land looking out. But if you look at, you know, view uh, just marquee images of other cities, it's always from the water looking in. And that's Mr. telling Gershon, to me. We should, you know, it, you have to have that skyline just look extraordinary. That should be the bar. This is our only shot at this. This is the 50 year decision. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Mayor. A um, couple things attended a skateboard meeting. As a skateboard, we passed legislation, which included a uh, legislation agenda, I should say, recommendation, which included some of the things we talked about, about noise, um, particularly in vehicles challenging um, our state legislatures to uh, write laws that might prevent installation and excessive noise on vehicles and uh, purchase of such items. I know we're gonna be speaking about something like that later when we do our legislative agenda discussion. Uh, Council Member Banks, quick update on the squid -orama. I showed up, it was pouring rain. We had to cancel the dive because the visibility was like this close to my face. A um, couple of people, volunteers jumped in the water and released the squid on the surface. Uh, of course, they had dry suits and everything. So it wasn't like, you know, like a summer swim or something like that. But it was well attended. Uh, I mean, for who could attend. But I want to say the artwork was fabulous. Um, Ashley and Mei Ling did a fantastic job. From when I was there, I know Tracy, I think our council member um, Buxton showed up later too. But unfortunately, the weather and COVID really took some of the wind out of the sails and of course, the uh, some of the other things we'd like to do. Um, 
we had a transportation meeting tonight. Uh, we talked about several things on the, the TIP, um, very informative. Um, some of the damage that the storm had caused to some of our roads and, and um, we talked about the marina as well and some of the impacts there, along with the plan for the traffic calming that's been very successful. Some for the public that may not know what we're talking about, you've seen the signs where they tell you if you're exceeding the speed limit and flashing. And our, our, our staff has been very resourceful in putting those in, uh, doing a lot of the work themselves to save money. And as they get put throughout town and we have, a, we have a great placement all over town, so all neighborhoods are being covered and there's more to come as we move forward, but it's making people slow down. And we'll never know if we save somebody's life, which is worth the investment in its own right. So I wanna compliment staff for that. And the last thing I wanna say is, I want everybody, things have been tough. COVID has been out there. Some people are gonna be visiting their families, you know, of course be safe, continue to, you know, COVID has not gone away. Could, you know, continue to be uh, hand sanitizers, wear masks where appropriate, those types of things. But one thing is, is we're divided and we need to be together. So with your family, and whoever you can and bring in, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Okay. Um, brief report. Um, I too attended the Maritime High School grand opening. Boy, are we fortunate. And they have an amazing group of kids. It's a perfect fit for Des Moines. I couldn't say, I mean, it's just, it's fabulous. Um, They also, the Highline School District sent out an email to many people today. They've opened, um, well, they promised a tour of Highline High School that uh, took a couple years to redo. And it was an older building. They saved the front facade. Um, and I believe they even saved the stained glass of the pirate. So that, and I don't know how far back that goes, but I, I think it was a student body that put together the money to make that happen. Anyway, it's a 360 degree virtual tour. I saw the email today. So if, uh, I'm sure if for the public, you could probably go to the Highline School District website and, and see that. They're very proud of it and I'm sure it will be available. Um, tonight we had an environmental meeting and we had a presentation uh, from uh, Tyler and, and Beakley and, and Ben, and I'm sorry, Ben, I can't remember your last name right now. Um, but anyway, the, um, the, the presentations were great. They covered our surface water management program, CIP um, updates, and they go through an awful lot. We don't have the time for that. So I'll say some of the highlights are the 239th um, stair and pipe project that uh, they've done a fabulous job on. Some uh, Soundview Redondo Beach Drive pipe that is, again, this, these pipes are dealing with uh, channeling surface water management, uh, surface water away from private property. So they did some work on, uh, on the 256th um, outfall. And then one of the other things that the team is working on and, they're, and that's coming forward um, is they're committed to trying to make our, our, our creeks and streams fish bearing in as much as they can be again. And so there's a restoration process which really involves the removal of fish barriers. So they're, they're working um, with government, other government agencies to make that happen and they've done an outstanding job. Then the last thing I wanna do, and, I for, and forgive me folks, if I forget anybody, it's not intentional. I only mention these things as I know them and, and they're brought to my attention, but we've had a really busy, um, November from the standpoint of birthdays. And I want to wish a happy birthday to our strategic officer, Susan Cesar. Um, and uh, I would also like to wish a happy birthday to our Harbor master, uh, Scott Wilkins. I know he's on the call, but he's not gonna turn on his camera. And uh, also council member, Jeremy Nutting. Happy birthday. And council member Louisa Banks. So anyway, happy birthday, everybody. I hope you've had uh, wonderful times and celebrations with your families and, and friends and so forth. And then the last thing I would like to do is dovetail up uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney's comment. These, we're moving into the holidays and you know, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a rough ride, folks, but 
we it's always good to come together and, and find a way to celebrate and to be thankful. And we are, um, between now and the time this council meets again, it will be Thanksgiving. And take the time, however you celebrate it, even if you are, if you, if you, if you're just spending it alone by choice, um, just be thankful. Think about the things you're thankful for, because we really do have a lot to be thankful for, even with all the difficulties that we have to deal with. So I wish you all the best and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. The, um, we are at the end of our meeting. Our next council meeting will be on December 2nd. Um, still in 2021, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I see the motion by Councilmember Banks, seconded by uh, Councilmember Nutting. All those in favor, please raise your hand until I call your name. Councilmember Harris, Councilmember Banks, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, Councilmember Buxton, Councilmember Nutting, and myself. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everybody.